Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webcast, Choosing the Right Trustee for Your Family Business. And at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Barbara Spector. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to run through a couple of administrative points. This is a 60-minute program, and we welcome your questions throughout the presentation. Just follow the prompts on your computer to enter the questions whenever they occur to you. My Family Business Magazine colleague David Shaw will be receiving the audience questions and asking them on your behalf. The presentation slides will be emailed to all participants after the webinar, and the replay will also be available for you to review. The topic of our discussion this afternoon, choosing a trustee, is one of the most important family business decisions you will make. It's important to understand the consequences of your choice. Our speakers today will provide plenty of food for thought in that regard, and it's my pleasure to introduce them. Tom Frank is the Executive Vice President and Northern California Regional Manager at Whittier Trust. Whittier Trust was started by the Whittier family, a Southern California energy and real estate family, to serve as a trustee for their family trust to streamline the intergenerational transfer of the family's wealth and to mitigate the issues that arise when family members serve as trustees. Whittier Trust is still privately owned by the Whittier family and its employees, and it works with over 400 individuals and families. We also have Tara Bond. Tara is a director of shareholder services for the Clemens Food Group and a fifth generation member of the Clemens family. Her duties include serving as a liaison among shareholders in the company, as well as coordinating professional services. Tara and Tom have a wealth of practical information, as it were, to share, so let's get right to it. To get it started, here's Tom Frank of Whittier Trust. Barbara, thank you very much for the introduction, and welcome, everyone. So one of the first questions that folks might be wondering when thinking about this topic is why would you put a family business in a trust to begin with? And in our experience, there are three main reasons. The first is estate and tax planning. Frequently, family business owners can place a limited interest ownership uh, interests, whether it's stock or parts of an LLC or a limited partnership, into trusts for younger generation family members. Discounts can usually be obtained on these gifts for lack of marketability and lack of control. Frequently, these interests may not have voting rights. They may not be able to compel an income distribution and often they're subject to restrictions on the sale. Another common reason families would put business in a trust is for asset protection. In today's age of uh, uh, seeming marital instability sometimes, uh, assets held in a trust for a beneficiary are clearly delineated as separate property rather than marital or community property. And in, it, it's easy to commingle assets inadvertently in a marriage situation, and so having these assets separately marked uh, is, is very helpful. Also, typically, assets held in an irrevocable trust will have spendthrift protection, which means that they're typically immune from creditors. And we've seen this happen frequently um, with clients, again, facing either a marital dissolution or perhaps even outside creditor problems. And then finally, Maintaining management and control of a family business in the hands of either managing family members or perhaps non-family member managers um, helps transfer ownership of the business while at the same time streamlining control. Let's take a step back and just talk about what is a trust. For those of you who may not be familiar, a trust is simply a legal entity whereby one trustee, one party called the trustee, holds title to property for the benefit of another party or parties. Those folks are called the beneficiaries. There are three parties to a trust, the person who puts the property into the trust, known um, simultaneously as a grantor, trustor, or settlor, depending on the drafting attorney's preference. The person or persons for whom the trust is being established, those are the folks known as the beneficiary, and then the trustee. Importantly, the trustee holds legal title to the property, while the beneficiaries are said to have equitable title in the property. 
And I think this is where uh, most people know who the grantor is going to be. Most people know what the asset is going to be with a family business. Um, and uh, I think choosing a beneficiary is uh, usually easy. Uh, then we get to the difficult part of the trustee and who naming the trustee and who is going to have control over the trust. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the duties of the trustee because this comes into play frequently um, in determining who the best trustee would be in any given situation. The primary duty of a trustee is to safeguard and manage the trust property. In the case of real estate, a building, a home, something like that, ensuring the property against loss. That's pretty basic. In, in the case of managed assets, whether that's an active business or a securities portfolio, prudently managing the property is extremely important. The trustee will need to make distributions of the property or the income produced by the property to the beneficiaries in accordance with the terms of the trusts. Um, and this could be on a discretionary basis. It could be mandatory income distributions. There are various different arrangements. Fiduciary duties are set out both by the common law, court cases, and statutory law. The law is different in each state with respect to the statutory restrictions, but these are some of the common fiduciary duties. There's a duty of loyalty. So the trustee has to administer the assets of the trust solely in the interest of the beneficiaries. There's a duty of prudence, which is an objective standard of care in managing the trust property. There's a duty not to commingle the trust property and the trustee's personal property. And folks might think, well, that should be pretty clear and not uh, something that happens very often. But I have to tell you, Tara, in our experience serving as a corporate trustee, sometimes individual family members, particularly a surviving spouse who serves as a trustee, may inadvertently commingle her own property with that of the trust from ease of management. There's a duty of impartiality. There can't be any favoritism on the part of the trustee between the current and future beneficiaries. And then finally, there's a very important duty to inform and account to the beneficiaries. Tara, this can you think Barbara. of anything else? Um, I'm sorry, this is Barbara. I was just going to jump in and say, in the duty to inform the beneficiaries, does that include explaining why decisions have been made, or is that really the grantor or the family's responsibility? So would that be sure. why decisions were made about how the how the trust is being managed? Yes. Yes. Um, the beneficiary always uh, can always ask, but it, it, it is really up to the um, the trustee has the fiduciary duty uh, to make decisions that they think are um, at, you know in the best interest of the trust to protect uh, to protect the trust asset. Um, they do actually. There is an insurance product uh, for trustees. It's a uh, you know a, a business liability uh, product because there are times where a beneficiary may think that an asset has been uh, mismanaged or may disagree, and that's uh, you know how lawsuits can arise. Um, uh, in the in the in, in family businesses where the, the family business asset uh, is, uh, is what's being held in trust, something, one of the really difficult things I think that a lot of trustees um, have is really uh, the fiduciary duty uh, and the, the duty to diversify assets. And I think we'll get into that in the next slide. Yeah, that's right. The beneficiaries have a remedy um, typically under state law, to demand what's called an accounting. So they can actually go before a judge and demand that the trustee explain to them what has happened in the trust. Um, usually that's limited to a list of the assets and a list of the transactions. In practice, in my three decades of working at, at corporate fiduciaries, a best practice is really to keep all of the beneficiaries informed in a general way about what is happening in the trust. Um, that builds a, a level of trust and comfort among the beneficiaries with the management of the trust and tends to forestall any difficult situations, including litigation, as Tara mentioned. 
Uh, and typically in um, in the work that I do in working with trustees, um, our, our trustees typically pr do provide uh, an accounting each year uh, to the beneficiaries um, and also settlers as well, um, or uh, if you know they are still living. That's great. Thank you, Tara. You know, you mentioned this duty to diversify, and this is a, a a common law duty that has been enshrined in many states' statutes. Um, state laws typically include some version of something called the Prudent Investor Act. Historically, 100 years ago, not even that long ago, state legislatures would publish a list of permissible investments in trusts. That might just be limited a long time ago to very safe bonds. Um, it was gradually most of these state legislatures gradually increased those lists. And by the 1970s, modern portfolio theory crept in and the idea of managing a basket of assets prudently um, was introduced and has now been adopted virtually across the board. So trustees typically have to consider investments in a very broad context. However, absent any special language or considerations in the trust, the trustee does have this common law duty to diversify. Now, how does this work in the context of a trust where the sole asset is the ownership interest in a family business? So we talked about before, one of the reasons a family might set up an irrevocable trust is to put business interest in trust for maybe grandchildren or great-grandchildren or even further generations. And the only asset of that trust for a period of time might be shares of stock perhaps in the family company. Would a, would a trustee be forced to diversify? And again, so this, it's depending yep. on, go ahead. <laughs> this is um, one of, uh, so the Clemens family, we use trust for minors to pass down ownership interest uh, in the company. Um, and typically those shares come out of trust sometime um, there is individual ownership after that. Sometime uh, when the beneficiaries are typically in their 20s, um, sometimes it's later. Uh, and those, I would say, would be trusts that are just set up for estate planning purposes. Um, but as our shareholders get into their 20s, some of them will start working with financial advisors. And this is typically the first conversation that uh, I will have uh, with a new financial advisor uh, that's calling in to learn about this asset uh, that their client has. And that's typically one of the first things they will ask um, is, w what are the opportunities to sell? Because this is, this is really the only asset, uh, at, you know, when someone's in their 20s that they have, and, and we need to diversify. Um, and so uh, typically what I will do is then start talking about the need to uh, keep ownership uh, of, the, of the company within the family uh, and that there are, there are avenues to sell, but that it is pretty, uh, it's pretty limited and that the, the purpose for holding the stock is continuity of the family business. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's something that's very commonly faced by trustees. Again, most trustees are very nervous about holding a single asset position. Um, and uh, again, because of this duty to diversify. Now, I've seen plenty of language in trust documents that either directs the trustee or requests the trustee or even purports to indemnify the trustee for holding and retaining a family business interest. And those um, in a survey of court cases, depending on the facts and circumstances, can usually be upheld by a court. Um, there are also certain jurisdictions, Whittier Trust being in California, we use Nevada uh, as our favored trust uh, state, um, has something called a directed trust statute, which would allow someone other than the trustee to direct the investments, including the retention of a family business asset in a trust. And that absolves the trustee then of that responsibility. And so as, if, yeah, as folks are looking um, into, into trusts and where to set them up, 
Um, the state, uh, a lot of times, um, I will say a lot of our trusts are set up in Pennsylvania because we are based in Pennsylvania. Um, but it is really important to look at um, the different trusts available in, uh, in each state. Nevada, for example, um, is very trust friendly um, and has uh, some great provisions for setting up trusts. One of the other things that should be looked at as well are length of time um, to, to hold assets in trust. Um, so there's uh, been a lot more talk recently of dynasty trusts uh, and how long assets can be held uh, in trust. And so that may be um, uh, something folks would be looking at as well, uh, you know, the length of time that a state would allow assets to be held in trust. Um, and as Tom, as we were preparing for this, something that I learned that I thought was really interesting is also considering the location of the trustee as we get into uh, who should be selected as a, who are possibilities to select as a trustee. Yep, that's uh, a great quick segue. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry a quick a quick question from uh, the audience. Uh, what, what you were both talking about uh, in terms of the duty to diversify. So ju just to be clear, uh, there, for a family-owned business that might be worried about loss of control issues and so on, that, that duty to diversify doesn't necessarily mean diversifying beyond family business stock if it's a directed trust, correct? And then I guess a side question to that is, Tara, does Clemens allow uh, the sale of, of stock and diversification to other kinds of assets? Uh, so we do, uh, yes, we do allow the sale of uh, stock in very uh, limited cases. Uh, we have what we call a redemption policy, uh, and we are allowed to redeem stock. We allow shareholders to redeem stock for education um, and then also um, for, the, for the purchase of a home, for the, the purchase of their uh, first home, a, a certain amount. Um, but that really is, uh, those are really the only opportunities to redeem. Um, so typically the question that I get uh, when a, a new financial advisor comes on board is, what else is there? And, and there really isn't anything else. Um, and I, I think that does make folks nervous. Um, because there is a duty to diversify. But again, the, the purpose of the trust is to retain ownership of, of, retain family ownership of the business. And so language along those lines can be included in uh, trust documents. That, you know, this is the purpose of the trust. Yeah, I think in practice, the, um, the inclusion of that language, or if someone is really concerned, the use of a, uh, a friendly jurisdiction, whether it's Nevada or Delaware, that would allow a directed trust, um, that, that, that those states really would, the, the trustee is off the hook if the outside investment director directs the trustee to continue to hold the family business interest. Again, I think a best practice in terms of managing this towards the end result, which as Tara said is, you know, keeping control of the family business within the family is really good communication with the beneficiaries, right? And making sure that everyone in the family understands this is a vehicle for asset protection, for passing the, the biggest family asset, the family business down uh, without getting a tax hit every generation. You know, all of the reasons for that, articulating it, documenting on the part of the trustee, documenting, um, why the, why the trust is in place and having these discussions with the beneficiaries will all go a long way towards protecting the trustee from liability. If we Great, move on you. to, yep, sure. If we move on to the issues in selecting a trustee, um, obviously, you know, the, the grantor, particularly if this is G1, you know, the first generation wealth creator, they want someone who would look at the world and uh, see the world as they do with respect to their, their family business. There's clearly a need for business continuity, so some sort of management transition, whether that's to family mem member managers or non-family member managers or a combination thereof. Obviously, the grantor is going to want someone who will work well with management. And then perhaps, depending on the type of business, a trustee who has some particular expertise or knowledge who can provide ongoing counsel 
uh, to the business, right? I mean, you've got management who's trying to run this business, and then you may have family member owners who aren't part of the business who have a lot of questions. And so sometimes the trustee can sit in between and assist management with shareholder communications. Um, Tara, does that say, happen in your family? Uh, actually, I was going to say uh, that typically is uh, the role that that I uh, serve um, and uh, my colleague as well that that we serve as the the liaison between you know the the family and and the business. Uh, the trustee, we have a number of um, different trustees. Uh, there, we have a few corporate. Um, we have some relatives, siblings and parents, and I know we'll get into issues inherent uh, in those. Um, and then we have one individual who actually was part of the company, was a, a corporate secretary. Um, and while he was with the company, uh, he now works for a, a wealth management firm, uh, but while he was with the company, did serve as the liaison um, between uh, the trustees uh, and what was going on in the business. I think sometimes you do want to be careful that the, the trustee that you have, um, uh, that the duties that they have for the business does not also conflict with their duties as a trustee. Um, so that is something uh, just to be mindful of. Um, and the one individual that I mentioned who, who now works for a wealth management firm, uh, he actually is a trustee for about 100, a little over 100 trusts that we have um, set up for, uh, for minors. Uh, so when we go through any sort of change in either the redemption policy or if we're talking about cash needs of the business, he is someone that we will reach out to to keep informed um, of the goings on in the business. You know, Terry, you raise an interesting point about potential conflicts with the trustee and, and either someone in management or, or someone else in the family. And, and I've seen this come up in situations sometimes where the family lawyer, you know, may represent one or more generations in the family um, and just serve as a general counselor to the family. They may also be involved in the business. They might be general counsel to the business. They might be on the board of the business. And then if they're also asked to serve as a trustee, that puts them in a tricky situation. And so I think in situations where a family has outside advisors who they want to be a part of this process, it's really helpful to break out everyone's roles and responsibilities ahead of time. You know, Terry, you also brought up in our, in our pre-call for this, uh, one of the issues in selecting a trustee is actually this, the state in which your trustee resides. So uh, California is specific in this regard, and, and I think perhaps different. There may just be one other state. I haven't done an exhaustive review. Where the, the mere fact that the trust administration occurs in California will subject the, at least part of the trust assets to California state income tax. And so for um, families where the family business and the assets are in California, that's going to happen anyway. But if you've got a family business, to, like, for example, yours that's in Pennsylvania, and you may have a family member who lives in Malibu and wants to serve as a trustee, um, just know that that may create some income, adverse income tax consequences uh, to that particular trust. As we move on and thinking about who to select as a trustee, you know, many times a business owner would say, well, I want my child or children who are involved in the business to serve as a trustee. And we've seen some issues with this come up. Uh, first of all, the ability to name a child assumes that you have a child who has the interest in the ability to run the company uh, to either work with or oversee non-family member managers. Uh, sibling rivalry. Uh, sometimes these things go back, you know, decades and can be very difficult to deal with whether or not the, the kids are in the, in the business. In-laws, I've been in more than one family meeting where a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law will raise issues that can create tensions and challenges. Um, Tara, clearly your family has been able to navigate this issue, but beyond the second generation, sometimes cousins are even more remote and conflicts can, uh, can easily arise. And finally, and I think this is the one that, that we see frequently, 
is when one sibling is named as a trustee for other siblings, it really puts an additional burden on them to look after uh, their brothers and sisters. Uh, this is particularly the case um, if those siblings aren't involved in the family business. Have you guys come across any of this in your family business? Uh, I was so the uh, trusts that are set up um, uh, for minors. Uh, typically, it is a uh, either this one individual who I mentioned, uh, a parent, um, or an aunt or an uncle. Um, one thing that is nice uh, is that. W- Once trusts expire and and shareholders are, say, in their 20s, they do have individual ownership of the stock, so they are holding it outright. Um, And then typically what they will do is then turn around and start setting up trust for the next generation. Uh, So one thing that is nice is that folks have not had to, I call it living within a trust. So siblings have not had to uh, live within a trust um, and have to, you know, have one sibling managing the trust. Um, or have a, a sibling that is um, a, a trustee. Um, the, the case where we have seen that um, are trusts that are set up for asset protection, and that's typically done in the event of divorce. Um, and there absolutely is some tension there um, because you'll have one, it, it may be a parent who's um, protecting assets as they're handing it down. It may be uh, a trust that's set up um, b- before marriage, um, but typically what happens is a, a parent is naming a sibling to manage to uh, act as a trustee over another sibling's trust. And as you can imagine, it's you know, don't you think I'm responsible? <laughs> um, uh, they're difficult conversations to have. I have yeah, an I, interesting question from uh, the audience, Tom, that's relevant to the sibling side. It might get a little technical, but I find it very fascinating. So if, uh, so th- this questionnaire, uh, they have four trustees, all are siblings who own the stock and the business in trust, two males, two females. They own their o- own stocks but are trustees for each other. Um, this one, so you, you might want to talk a little bit about this, but the big question is that they have a women-owned business status, and they'd like to make sure that 1%, an extra 1% is given to the women in the family um, you know, to ensure that they it, retain that status. And I guess the question is, is it okay that the woman is a stockholder but a trustee is a male? You know How, how do they keep 51% women-owned in this scenario if not? Does the trustees, uh, gender affect ownership? Well, that, that is a very specific question, and I'm afraid, Dave, I don't, <laughs> I don't have the answer off the top of my head. I think that's a, that's an, uh, a creative um, approach for sure, and obviously um, I would uh, advise the questioner to ask their counsel uh, this question. It would certainly be well worth um, spending some legal dollars on, on an answer there. I think, you know, from a, from a practical standpoint, um, in, um, in a family situation where the siblings all get along, where they all understand why the assets are being placed in trust, um, where it is a particularly harmonious situation, in-laws included, um, you know, I suppose that this could work. I, I think um, in my experience, I've just seen a lot of tension around this. And I think there are what, you know, we'll discuss a little bit later on other ways for the family to maintain control uh, without necessarily having the liability that comes with being a trustee. And, you know, as people age, these issues uh, can increase. And so, you know, our next topic here really is naming a spouse as a trustee, and I think you could have aging children as, as kind of a, a corollary here, right? So um, thinking about, uh, about naming a spouse as a trustee, this seems like a natural, right? Particularly for the first generation wealth creator, um, perhaps the spouses have been involved in the business together, and the spouse is a natural um, successor. You know, so the question would be, is the spouse involved in the business? Um, does the spouse have particular knowledge? Are they qualified to run the business? Uh, one of the big issues is 
is the surviving spouse the parent, a parent of heirs, or is it a step parent? And um, I will tell you that some of the fastest growing areas of our business are situations where stepchildren are suing step parents who are the trustee uh, for lack of management, lack of uh, control, uh, lack of uh, transparency and communication. And so that can be very, very difficult, both on the surviving spouse and the children, obviously. Um, one question, and this is one's a hard, hard one to answer, you know, is it likely that the surviving spouse will get remarried or get into a subsequent relationship? And we've seen this at all ages, by the way. Um, going back to kind of the tying into the sibling question, you know, what happens if there's questionable capacity? And I think, you know, all of us uh, from our own family situations are familiar with age related capacity issues. And it doesn't have to go so far as to have someone actually be adjudicated incompetent to handle their own financial affairs. As people age, they may just lose the ability to be on top of things to the degree needed to be a good trustee. Um, I, we've seen situations where a surviving spouse, uh, you know, one of the children lives closer uh, to the surviving spouse and and uh, whether or not they actually exert undue influence, a sibling who lives farther away might question that. Um, and then, you know, sometimes the surviving spouse likes to open the Chardonnay at 11 o'clock in the morning, and then that can create some challenges as well. And so I think as, as you know, with any um, aging person, having someone be legally responsible as a trustee for that operating business uh, and, and for those trust decisions can be very challenging. Tara, I don't know if you have anything to add on this. Well, topic. I was going to say, along those same lines, um, uh, there may be times. Um, one thing that is nice about selecting a trustee is that it is not always, it doesn't have to be permanent. Um, and something that can be done is putting, um, whether it's criteria for trustees, uh, who can manage uh, a trust, um, and for successor trustees. So we will have some trusts where um, the person will go and they will name a successor trustee. If they, if they know, um, for example, if, if the first trustee passes away, this is who we want to be the successor trustee. Or um, uh, there's also provisions that allow the current trustee to name a, su a successor trustee. Um, in the case where uh, the business assets where uh, typically those, it's ownership and it's not a controlling interest, it's a, a, a non-voting share, um, those provisions work well. Uh, we also have voting trusts that do hold uh, voting stock, and for those, there are criteria for um, who can be trustee. It's not as easy as, as naming the successor trustee. I have a question yeah, one, as far as the um, the skills of a family member who's a trustee. How important is emotional intelligence and specifically the ability to gently say no to a family member when that's warranted? Wow, that's a really good question. I mean, I think a you know one of the um, one of the duties of the trustee is to be responsive to the beneficiaries, whether those are the current beneficiaries who are receiving perhaps the income from the trust or future generation beneficiaries. And so emotional intelligence certainly helps. And, and getting back to the point that we made earlier about the, the best practice of being, you know, more communicative than less, I think that's very helpful. Um, I think, you know, again, where I've seen challenges with this is as a family member trustee ages, um, one or more um, children might put pressure on them to either increase a dividend or make a payout or make a loan or things like that. And, um, and so sometimes, you know, that, that, that could put the surviving spouse in a very difficult position. Um, to, and and it, it's hard to say no. You know, it's hard to say no to your – uh, children who might uh, actually have a good need for the money. Um, and the, the challenge comes in is that when siblings aren't aware of the situation or aren't in agreement with the situation, they may come in and, and say, well, you know, there's, there's undue influence here. And, I, you know, I've seen specific cases of that where 
there's just been a general level of mistrust. And again, communication tends to uh, dampen the, the tension around those types of things. You know, one of the things that we didn't mention, Tara, was the, the ability sometimes to name a co-trustee. And so perhaps um, having a family member serve as a trustee to deal with some of those more EQ issues along with a, a trustee who may have more involvement in the business or more business acumen or just may be able to keep better books and records, sometimes that's a really good solution for families. Absolutely. Um, I think um, I'm trying to think if we have any with uh, co uh, trustees, um, not offhand that I can think of, but I think it is an excellent way, uh, uh, especially if you're a parent um, setting up a trust uh, for a child. So if, if it's passing down ownership of a family business. Um, for estate purposes. So, um, you know, we have a lot of trust, as I mentioned, set up for minor children. Um, sometimes having that a, a co-trustee there is nice. You may want a parent, which is great, um, and, you know, also someone uh, in the business as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's um, if, 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 if there are challenges or maybe some issues with naming um, a child or a spouse as a trustee. What about naming an independent trustee? Um, it sounds like that might be the perfect solution. But there are challenges there too, right? So does that independent trustee have the ability and expertise to work with management? Again, whether they're family members or non-family members. The, the biggest one that we've talked a lot about is that independent trustee willing and able to hold a single a concentrated position. Again, favorable state law jurisdiction, permissible language in the trust document goes a long way. Does that independent trustee have the ability to mentor and provide stewardship training to younger generation family members? We actually see this a lot where business owners will come to us and say, look, you know, my, um, my children or my grandchildren have these trusts and they're going to be receiving dividends from the family business. Um, they don't really know what to do with this money. Can somebody um, at the trustee's office talk to them about basic financial literacy and, and uh, what it means uh, to have the, the responsibility that comes with being the beneficiary of the trust? Ultimately, however, and I think this is what, you know, what you've stated, Tara, and it's certainly the case with the Whittier family, the, the founders and, and majority shareholders of Whittier Trust, they want family mem family control. Absolutely, um, and I think um, uh, I have heard of uh, certain instances. For example, and I'll, I'll get back to the voting shares, our voting trusts. Uh, the voting trusts uh, are always family members, um, and like I said, there's there's certain criteria. It's age, management experience um, uh, that vote the you know, they vote in the board of directors. It's ultimately control of the company. Um, and I think uh, as you're looking, as families look at trusts, um, they should absolutely look at provisions for um, how control of the, uh, the company is maintained. Um, so, for example, with the, the trusts for minors that we have set up, there really is no company control uh, issues there. Um, there are some uh, very few state law provisions in Pennsylvania where those shares would actually have to vote on things. Um, but ultimately, it's it's the voting trustees, um, and and one of the criteria for those uh, trusts uh, is that it is a family member. Yeah, that seems question. like a great idea. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I had a question. If a family business has strong professional management, why would the family want to put their ownership shares in trust? Well, that's a great question, Barbara. I think, I think getting back to, you know, why use a trust at all, and it typically is for um, the uh, estate and tax planning, right? So even with a, the large lifetime exclusion amounts that we have now. So a couple can pass, you know, over $22 million to their heirs without paying any estate tax. Um, you know, there are a lot of family businesses that are worth more than that. 
And so facing an estate tax burden at the federal level, and there are 15 or 16 states that have a state-specific estate tax uh, in addition to the federal tax, typically with much lower um, exemption thresholds, some, some tax planning is going to want to be done. You never want to be in a situation where the family business has to be sold over time to pay the estate taxes. So this, this type of planning, this intergenerational transfer, particularly that Tara has so, um, has so nice, nicely outlined for her own family, is really a critical part of making sure that the business stays in the family and isn't subject to, to an onerous estate tax. I think the asset protection issues also come into play. You know, we had a situation where a an income beneficiary of an irrevocable trust had some bad real estate dealings outside the trust and, and was for all intents and purposes uh, bankrupt. They had some outstanding uh, judgment creditors chasing them. And uh, the trust assets were protected. Um, so it's a very effective asset protection vehicle. Um, and until, you know, I, I, again, I like what, what Tara's family has done, you know, for these minor children, um, placing these uh, ownership assets in trust really helps protect them until they're old enough to get some of this training and, and learn about, um, about the responsibilities of being a family shareholder. Um, yeah, and I can't emphasize enough um, the estate planning uh, piece and tax piece of it. Um, in Pennsylvania, we do have an inheritance tax on dollar one. Um, so while uh, you know an individual has this eleven million dollar threshold, uh, Pennsylvania will start taking four and a half percent at dollar one. Um, so you know it, that ten million dollars. And that's 450000 in cash uh, that has to go to the state. So that, that is absolutely something that even though everyone enjoys the, the federal uh, you know, lift that we have right now, uh, we still are, are working in a state where um, we have a state inheritance tax. Um, and then the asset, control, or the, um, asset protection piece, I think, um, is also important. Um, Families absolutely struggle with talking about prenuptial agreements, um, but I think in that first slide that you had discussing asset protection, it really is easy. <laughs> it's a lot easier to talk about assets that are held in a trust, why they're held there, um, and keeping them completely separate um, as, you know, instead of uh, commingled with other assets. Um, it, it's, it's, trusts are easier, I think, than having that prenuptial conversation sometimes. For, for sure. I mean, we refer to them as a stealth prenuptial agreement, um, <laughs> and 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 um, and, they, and they work well. You know, they work well in that regard. Um, it's it's a it's a nice technique to be able to employ. Let's um, talk a little bit in the remaining time that we have, Tara, about some of these family governance options um, because keeping the family business in the family and having family control is the typical desire of family business owners. For example, Whittier Trust has something called a family council. The Whittier family, when they set up this trust company again to facilitate the intergenerational transfer of their wealth, decided that they didn't want any family members actively involved in the business, but they have a family council that is constituted of different generation family members. The family council meets quarterly, and the management of the trust company reports back to them on not only what the trust company is doing for them as trustee, but also uh, there are other assets that are held in the trust. So it's, it, it, it's turned into a very good vehicle for, for communicating with the beneficiaries, for allowing them the opportunity to ask questions. And then because younger generation family members are brought in as, you know, not very young, uh, not as children, but as young adults, it's a great opportunity to provide some stewardship training. I've also seen family situations where each branch of the family, so you go beyond you know, G1 or G2 maybe, each branch of the family may have a seat or an equal vote on the board. Um, you know, having family members involved at the board level can have pluses and minuses, um, and it may not address all of the conflict situations, but it's certainly an effective way for control. And it sounds a little bit like you know, fa your family, Tara, you've developed these very stringent guidelines about who in the family is going to vote that 
those shares, and it seems very similar to this kind of an arrangement. Yep, and that's absolutely how um, the f there are four voting trusts, and there were four uh, brothers who originally purchased the business from their father. Um, and that's how those voting trusts are set up by the four family branches. Uh, they vote in the board of directors. We have an independent board of directors, um, but they are the those four branches hold um, it, hold control. Yeah, I've seen in situations similar situations where even the buy sell agreements among the shareholders uh, that that limit their ability to sell. You know, you first have to offer your shares within your branch, right, to keep that ownership the same, and then you can offer it to other branches, things like that. So there, there's a there's a fair amount of flexibility, I think, with that kind of an arrangement. Yes, absolutely. We we talked about the idea of a directed trust, um, which is akin to this concept of something called a trust protector. Now, trust protectors are typically used um, or historically used uh, offshore, and you know. Um, Channel Islands jurisdictions and, th and things like that. But uh, the idea is that there is someone who is not the trustee who has the power to remove and replace the trustee. And, and Terry, you were talking about this, that the choice of a trustee doesn't have to be a permanent choice. It can be a fluid choice. Um, and, and frequently these, again, depending on state law and, and how clear the, the drafting is in the trust, that trust protector may not have fiduciary status, and so they, they may not have the same level of liability that the trustee has, but it gives the family member control over who the trustee is. Um, and something similar that um, we have done with the voting trusts, um, the voting trustees actually uh, have the ability, they act as trust protectors for, um, without being named, um, for the other trusts. So the voting trustees do have the ability um, to vote out one of the other voting trustees uh, for cause, but it's a, it's a checks and balances that was built into the voting trust agreements. Um, it has to be by uh, our the vote happens to be two thirds uh, in this, um, but a voting trustee could um, request a removal of another voting trustee. I think that's a great idea, and it just goes to show that a lot of flexibility can be built in to these governance systems to allow for changing circumstances, changing individuals, that sort of thing. Um, finally, one other option that we've seen, and this may not be a fit for all businesses, but uh, using some, something like a limited liability company or a limited partnership where there's a family member who retains management control but gives away um, non-managing, non-voting uh, shares uh, or interests in that asset. Um, again, that still requires that you have a family member who's able and willing to serve in that capacity, but it might be a nice way to structure things. This isn't an exhaustive list by any means. I think many, um, there are lots of very capable, experienced uh, trust and tax lawyers out there who have worked with families, uh, Tara, like yours and like the Whittier family, to help construct something tailored to that family's needs that will um, will help them best govern their family business. Yep, and as families look uh, for advisors, I think the most one of the most important things to remember is that um, they really do need to understand your family. So uh, if some, you know, if a, if an advisor comes in and says, "Well, this is the best practice. This is how it has to be done." Um, and, and that doesn't work for your family, they need to understand that um, and provide other solutions um, or, you know, look for different advisors. Um, I think knowing that there are so many different options out there um, and working with an advisor who really understands what the family goals are um, in retaining ownership of the business is, is important. That's, a, that's an excellent point. And I think with that, Barbara, Tara and I have kind of concluded our formal remarks. Um, hopefully we didn't go too long, but we'd be delighted to take questions from listeners. Certainly. Uh, this is David Shaw. I have, I have several to get us started. Um, and one is related to the uh, stealth prenup agreement. Uh, actually, at our transitions conference last week, as the questioner notes, um, there was discussion of pre- or post-nuptial agreements even with a trust. What's the benefit of having both? Uh, yeah, I'm not a... Uh, um, uh, 
a, a family lawyer, but it seems to me that's kind of a belts and suspenders approach. I, you know, my understanding, particularly in California, which is a community property state, that in order to have an effective prenuptial agreement, there has to be a lot of disclosure of best practices that both parties are separately and independently represented by counsel. So you have this situation where, um, you know, two people, and let's say they're two younger folks, right, are getting married, and before they get married, they both have to lawyer up and produce balance sheets and, and all of this kind of stuff. That isn't um, super romantic, right? And, and, and most folks aren't going to want to go through that, that process, as Tara, um, you, know, you know, correctly mentioned. And so, you know, there are a couple of ways to do it. Some families just have a family practice of everybody having a prenup. That might be easy, an easier way to explain it. But with a trust, you really don't have to go into that level of detail and disclosure in order for it to be effective. Now, certain states will um, will be able to look to trust assets, perhaps for child support payments um, uh, and 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 things like that. But it, it, it depending on how the trust is managed and how carefully it's managed towards the idea of maintaining its character as separate property, I, I think these trusts can be a pretty effective substitute in many cases. And again, I mean, it, it always depends on the, the state law, um, but I think in a very general sense, let's say it's a trust that uh, generates $10,000 a year, uh, we'll say, for example, um, that $10,000 uh, that that's generated each year, that may not be protected without a prenuptial agreement, but the underlying assets uh, would be. That is at a very general, that's a, a 10,000 uh, foot view, but that's generally one way to look at it. Um, that the, the underlying assets are typically uh, provided, but then what is distributed um, may not be. Okay. And uh, I'm, I'll try to paraphrase this question, but, uh, and Tara, I don't know if uh, how this works within your family, but if one member of the older generation passes shares along to his or, to, or her children, let's say in a trust, but others don't, how do you recommend talking about that situation to various people? cousins, I guess, so, so no one's feelings are hurt. Um, do you ever see, Tom, situations where one branch has trusts and the other doesn't and things have been transferred and the other doesn't? You know, in, in, in my experience, the families that have most uh, have been most successful at keeping the family business in the family have been pretty uniform in, in having that as a desire and have been pretty intentional about maintaining control through the use of trusts. Um, I suppose it's possible. I guess there are situations, you know, what, what comes to mind readily are situations where there might be an heir who is under some sort of a disability, um, where uh, those assets should be placed in trust for them because they're just simply not capable of managing it themselves, and other siblings might receive their shares outright. I think. You know, that's a. If, if, if the family's real goal is to keep this in the family, I, I, Terry, you jump in here. But I think that that I think that the trust situation is really probably the most ironclad way to go. It, it uh, yes, I agree. Um, I think the because the family has been using trust for so long. Um, uh, it's a it's a pretty common practice, and I don't want to say everyone does it. Um, most people do it. Uh, most people use trust to pass down shares. Uh, what I will say is what folks pass, the amount that folks pass down is absolutely different um, between all of the branches, but there really isn't that much um, visibility uh, to it within the family. The family doesn't know <laughs> what's in uh, each of the individual trusts. Um, where there uh, typically is difference is the older generations. Um, you know, what assets uh, are they uh, using? What assets are they using for charitable donations? That's typically where there is some difference, but um, we have such a large number of shareholders that uh, the values are going to be different for, for everyone. 
I have a question. What factors go into negotiating a fee with a corporate trustee? Uh, I would say so. <laughs> everything, sorry, anything sorry. you would use to negotiate a fee for <laughs> it, uh, everything is fair game. Um, typically, uh, I think a lot of people are hesitant to use corporate trustees um, because corporate trustees will, and, and I'm thinking of a few um, banks uh, that I've worked with, they'll look at the value of the asset and that's what they base their fee structure off of. That is absolutely negotiable. You know, if it's company stock uh, and it's, you know, increasing, decreasing, uh, you can take that portion out and talk about all of the other liquid assets um, under management. Yeah, so I think, uh, Terry, you're absolutely right. It really depends on what the corporate trustee is going to be doing. Um, in addition to serving as trustee. So um, will the trustee be sitting on the board? Will they be voting shares? Um, those are positions of increased responsibility for which the corporate trustee may want to be um, compensated separately. And again, that may not, the, the, the typical charge for a corporate trustee on, on liquid assets is the percentage of the assets under management. And, and frequently, as, as Tara mentions, that doesn't apply in the situation of a, of a family business. So I look and say, well, what, what are the roles and responsibilities of the trustee in this particular situation? A directed trustee, for example, who really is just, you know, providing safekeeping and a little bit of record keeping, um, and that's the only asset. Uh, in that situation, the fee would be less. And again, in a situation where the trustee might be sitting on the family board, making distribution decisions, making dividend decisions, um, making corporate level decisions, um, the compensation should be commensurate with those responsibilities and activities. Okay, I think we have time, Barbara, for one for one final question from the from the audience. We have more than we can get to as usual, and we will send these questions to Tom and Tara. And if they have the opportunity to answer them individually, uh, they certainly can. Tom, this this may be more for you, given the way uh, Clemens's uh, trusts are. Uh, uh, well, maybe not, uh, but <laughs> uh, if. I guess the question here is, um, how does a trustee balance the investment mix if there are two beneficiaries? Let's say one older, one younger, uh, where one beneficiary may be looking for long-term growth and be willing to take more risk, while the other maybe seeks safer investments. Do you do you see situations like that? Oh, sure. I mean, that is job number one of any trustee, right? Because what we when we were talking about what is a trust, what we really didn't talk too much about is typically there is an income beneficiary for life, someone who is entitled to the income and perhaps principal of the trust on a discretionary basis. And then after that person passes away, the money is usually going somewhere else, either to their children or other gener younger generation family members. And so balancing the interests of, the, of all of those beneficiaries and acting fairly with respect to all of them is, a, is the trustee's primary responsibility. So even in the context where the primary asset or the sole asset is a family business, you know, managing that business, um, these, these issues come up all the time. You know, what kind of dividend distribution should be made? This comes up sometimes with a surviving spouse. You know, the surviving spouse may want um, to, to declare significant dividends so they can support their lifestyle, whereas, you know, his or her children may want those that income to be plowed back into the business for future growth. So I think it's a very much a case-by-case -case basis, but that is something that all uh, trustees have to take very, very seriously. Barbara, you oh. can yeah. close us off. <laughs> yeah. Well, certainly there are a lot of moving parts in the, the issue of trusts, and we've heard a lot of great insights and real-world examples, and I really want to thank Tom and Tara for sharing your insights and expertise. 
Just want to remind everyone that the replay of this webinar will be available for you to listen to at your convenience. And now, on behalf of Family Business Magazine, Whittier Trust, and our speakers, I thank everyone for joining our webinar, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. May all disconnect now. <laughs>